My name is Henry Butler. I'm the executive director of the Law and Economic Center. Uh, welcome. Uh, for the out-of-town guest, um, welcome to Northern Virginia, the proud home of the headquarters of that dominant firm, AOL. <laughs> to learn more about the Law and Economic Center, plug in AOL keyword, Mason LEC. For those of you who don't know what AOL keyword is, that's, it's been a long time, but that's the way we used to search. I, I want to do a, a couple things uh, before I uh, uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate the Law Review staff on this, uh, this outstanding program, in particular Katie Brown, for the work she's done in putting that together. And I'm going to take a few minutes of uh, your time to tell you about the Law and Economics Center. Uh, the Law and Economics Center was founded in 1974 at the University of Miami uh, by a man named Henry Manny. And uh, he built, he had a vision of uh, expanding uh, the field of law and economics. Uh, he'd started that work earlier by running programs in economics for law professors. These were two week long programs and law for and that ha was a tremendous catalyst in developing law and economics into a truly dominant field of academic legal uh, research. In 1974 at, at Miami, he, he continued those programs. In 1976, he started a program uh, in economics for federal judges. Uh, he also had a great uh, program uh, for people at advanced degrees in economics to, to go to law school. And uh, I was privileged to be one of those folks who uh, took advantage of that program at the University of Miami, as did uh, Bill McLeod from Kelly Dry, one of our uh, sponsors here, uh, participated uh, in that program. Many of the, the folks here, uh, the academics here, have uh, participated in a lot of the LEC's uh, programs over the years. In 1980, the Law and Economics Center moved from, Emory Uni uh, from Miami to Emory University in Atlanta. Uh, continued to run all of its programs for professors, for judges, uh, and was really kind of an academic think tank in the sense that it uh, uh, brought in uh, scholars from other schools to spend their sabbatical years or to spend a semester on leave, and they had a very active workshop program. In 1986, a very important year for the history of uh, George Mason Law School, Henry Manny became the dean here uh, at the law school and brought with him the Law and Economics Center. And uh, so 26 years ago, uh, that program was coming here. Uh, many of the programs that Henry ha had been running have continued on. Uh, I became, uh, well, I was director of the law, and I, this is my second stint at Mason. I was here from 86 until 93, and for three of those years, I was director of the Law and Economic Center. And I just moved back in the summer of 2010, uh, after being at Northwestern University, uh, to become the director of the Law and Economic Center a second time. I tried to tell my mom it was a promotion, but she just isn't buying that story. <laughs> Um, but the, the Law and Economics Center uh, today operates through uh, five different divisions. Uh, one we call our Searle Civil Justice Institute, which uh, works on large-scale empirical projects uh, that are uh, managed by the Searle Center. We have from other schools as well as have a, have a research support staff here. Uh, we've worked on a variety of topics. Uh, uh, some of our better-known research has been on uh, state consumer protection acts, um, uh, arbitration agreements. And we have a, a pipeline of projects that are uh, that we're working on right now. Some re related to uh, federal rules of civil procedure, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, um, and that's a an big ongoing part of what uh, what we do here. Uh, we also have another uh, research group we call the Manny Program in Law and Economic Studies, uh, which sponsors uh, programs like this, as well as we are restarting the programs in economics for law professors and law for economics professors. We'll be doing those uh, this summer. Um, and uh, we have a variety of, of conferences. For example, in May, we'll have a conference on, uh, on search and online advertising. Uh, so we're working on a lot of antitrust issues uh, under that program. And we provide uh, support to the law school for the general uh, uh, faculty research uh, activities here uh, in the school. Uh, another program that we have is our judicial education program, the program that was founded in 1976 at, at Miami. Uh, that program is, is really our flagship the thing that we do. We've had over 4,000 sitting state and federal judges have come to at least one of our programs. Uh, the, the primary program we do with that is an Economics Institute for Judges, which is a two-week week long program, which uh, gives the judges a background in basic uh, microeconomic theory with numerous applications uh, to, uh, to, to legal and uh, public policy issues. 
Uh, we have a sister program uh, uh, of that, and that's our Attorney's General Education Program, uh, which has a, uh, a, a three-day boot camp on basic economic concepts, uh, as well as a number of uh, specialized programs that we hold. For example, this spring we're going to have a, uh, a conference on the pharmaceutical industry, looking at the the economics of the industry, uh, the regulatory and legal uh, issues that come up with that, and another program on uh, the financial uh, services regulation. Uh, we uh, like to take advantage of opportunities to, uh, to expose the AGs and their staff to, uh, to a lot of our programs. In fact, we have 35 uh, staff members from uh, AG offices that are here today. I appreciate it. They would stand up so that you know that they're sitting there. So please stand up, all my AG folks. Don't be shy. Thank you very much. I, I, we really, um, we do all of our programs without any tuition, and um, we provide tra transportation, hotel rooms, group meals, and all these things, but uh, fundamental economics, there's no such thing as a free seminar, and the most uh, valuable uh, resource that goes into that is the time of the folks that take away from their busy jobs to come here and join us. So thank you very much for, for taking your time to join us for this program. Um, and then finally, we have a program up on, that we run up on Capitol Hill with the awkward name of the Congressional Cau Civil Justice Caucus Academy, uh, where we, we do uh, briefings on civil justice issues on the Hill. It's a very bipartisan uh, group. We have Democrats and congressional members of that, and we're trying to find common ground on important civil justice issues with that. So um, we've got a lot going on here at the center. The, the Law and Economic Center is an integral part of the law school. Uh, if you've uh, just to give you a sense of, of how different this school is because of the Law and Economic Center, we have a required first semester course for all of our students in economic foundations of legal studies. So all of our students have a three-hour course in microeconomics, which provides a great, great uh, starting point for use of economics in a lot of other classes that we have here. Now, we've, uh, this school has come a long way since uh, 1986. It was uh, uh, really changed the direction and turned us into the school that we are today. And one of the key people who helped us do that is our speaker today, Bill Kovacic. Uh, Bill and I both joined the faculty here in 1986. Uh, we were a lot younger and thinner then, I think, Bill. Uh, and uh, we, we had a, a, a lot of fun as uh, the school was turned around. We were the, the first new faculty members here uh, mm -hmm. and uh, hired a lot of new people in the first couple of years we were here and really turned this into a, to a very different place. Bill uh, is a was a fantastic colleague here at the, at the law school. Um, prior to that time, he had uh, uh, practiced law for a while uh, and served, uh, worked at the FTC in the Bureau of Competition, as I yep. recall. Uh, Bill stayed here for, um, for 12 years and then went over to, to GW Law School. Uh, in the, uh, 2001 to 2004, he served as general counsel at the FTC under our colleague here, George Mason, Tim Muris, while Tim was the, was the chair of the FTC. And then he returned to the FTC uh, five years ago and just finished up that, that service there. Um, so Bill is, uh, is, is, uh, has distinguished himself as a scholar, uh, an outstanding uh, classroom teacher, uh, and someone who's very devoted to the institutions that he's involved at. He was a, very much involved and passionate about the success of George Mason Law School, and I'm sure the people at, at, at GW and at the FTC have, have felt that uh, passion as well. So it's really great to have Bill come back here to talk with you about his views about antitrust and high-tech industries. Please welcome Bill Kovacic. Thank you, Henry. Thanks very much, Henry, and thanks, Katie, for inviting me to participate in an uh, event that uh, is, is a delightful one and uh, gets, uh, gets better all the time. Um, I, for me, the most single interesting part of going to a public agency after spending most of my life as an academic was to appreciate more completely the difficulties associated uh, with implementing programs that had strong conceptual appeal but had to run the gauntlet of actual implementation, what uh, Graham Allison in his book, The Essence of Decision, 40 years ago, uh, referred to as the path between the idea and implementation, how hard that was to travel. Uh, as an academic, I got glimpses from time to time that there was a gap between the academics who thought about things and the people who practiced them. I, I went to a conference on the aerospace sector in Southern California in the mid-1990s and attended a reception uh, speaking with uh, one of the people who seemed faintly familiar, uh, but 
we started talking about the space program. That had been the topic of one of the sessions. Uh, and I began talking to him about uh, all that NASA did to develop uh, the Apollo program, uh, the difficulties associated with designing the launch vehicle and crew cabins, uh, the great logistical tasks associated with pulling all of this together and actually conducting the mission. And quite politely and quietly, he said, that's very interesting, and at one point said, you seem to know a lot about the space program. I said, of course I do. Um, I teach government contracts, I know about antitrust, high tech, and we went on for another pre-program 55 minutes uh, telling him what I knew. And then I said, you seem to know a lot about the space program too, and I didn't catch your name before. He said, my name is Gene Cernan, I was the last man to walk on the moon. Um, <laughs> there are many occasions uh, to see the difference between theory and practice and to be brought down to earth, but being at the FTC was an occasion to do exactly that, uh, to see the extent to which uh, interesting ideas have to be grounded in, in practical programs. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today, which is uh, the extent to which the framework through which policy is made in this domain in particular uh, might be improved in the future to make it more effective. Uh, the basic idea that so wonderfully developed in Dan Crane's new book on the institutions of competition law. The basic notion that policy travels over an in infrastructure of institutions, uh, and as one colleague mentioned to me at GW years ago, if you want uh, broadband quality policy, you can't get it over dial-up institutions. Uh, and how does one go about improving the institutional conduits uh, through which policy content is, is delivered? I'm going to focus in particular uh, on the federal enforcement joint venture through which the U.S. makes policy. Um, capturing some of the themes that have come up earlier today and you're familiar with in the literature, uh, in talking about high technology and competition law, a great deal of attention uh, is devoted to this perceived mismatch. Uh, what's special about the high tech sector and has been special through the history of the competition system in the U.S., it is complex and dynamic. It moves quickly. All sorts of complications arise from this that courts and enforcement agencies have seen from the earliest days. Uh, when you read, for example, the 1931 Standard Oil uh, cracking case dealing with the production of gasoline and other petroleum products uh, uh, from crude oil, uh, you see the tremendous difficulty the court has deciding whether the old incumbent technology significantly constrains the new emerging technology, catalytic cracking, what's in the market, what's out of the market, how to define the market significance of the parties. Uh, and one, just one of many settings in which the fact of rapid technological change uh, posed a problem that the competition system throughout its history has had a very difficult time handling. Um, the critique going back to the beginning, going back to to Walter Lifman and Drift and Mastery, who referred to the antitrust people as simply promoting the, the mindless scramble of little profiteers uh, without any sense of the deeper problems associated with technological progress. Um, three basic critiques from this time onward, different variations over time, uh, but common themes. First, uh, the relevant antitrust institutions just don't know enough. And they don't know enough at two key points in the analytical process. They don't know enough to make an accurate diagnosis of what's taking place. And when they find a pathology, they don't know enough to apply a cure that's going to make things better. Uh, the second deficit is they're too narcissistic in their approach. They don't take account of other institutions that shape the relevant policy framework and commercial activity. And they tend to treat competition law and the enforcement of competition statutes as being the only appropriate way to solve problems that emerge in the area. Uh, and last, they're far too slow. They can't possibly get their arms around the problem in time to cope with the circumstances that take place. It was not long after the development of the automobile as a key part of the transport sector that one competition uh, commentator said, the antitrust system looks in the rear view mirror while all the action is coming ahead through the windscreen. Um, where do we stand today with respect to these three critiques? Uh, I think there's, on the point of insularity and narcissism, there's far less of that today than before. 
you can trace this back to the FTC's hearings in the mid-1990s on innovation, certainly to the publication of the To Promote Innovation Report in 2003, where there's an unmistakable recognition uh, that problems often observed in the competition policy realm uh, have their roots in the IP rights granting process and that first best solutions would necessarily focus attention on improvements in that process and not simply the second best outcome of using abusive dominance mandates for access uh, to cure problems that reside in the rights granting process. Um, second, I think there's a much better recognition over time uh, of the need to improve knowledge uh, and to improve the relative speed of the process. Um, look at the relevant mi relative mix that public consultations with specialists in the field have taken in the entire array of things that agencies do. Uh, the keen attention to the recruitment of good personnel. Uh, uh, the case of Suzanne Michelle, who many of you know, in 2001, she was the one patent attorney at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, she was the essential facility. Uh, uh, in the cafeteria, others of us tasted her food first. She was escorted across the street uh, so that no harm would come to her. Um, she was indispensable to the development of the agency's programs, but she gently but persistently made clear that if you want to do big things that involve the patent antitrust relationship, it would be good to have more people who are patent lawyers. The agency grew its staff to about 10 over time. That's not infinity, but it was a lot better than the single person we had. Uh, and I think a big question for the FTC going ahead uh, is the replacement of Suzanne, uh, who at the level of middle management, upper, upper middle management and knowledge, probably has been as influential a figure at the FTC over the past 15 years or so as any other single individual. An extraordinary bit of capability that left the agency over time. None better uh, in this field. Uh, a sobering reminder of how quality of staff, human talent, can ebb and flow in ways that dramatically affect uh, the capacity of the agency to do good work. Uh, last, uh, there's, there's a great need uh, to improve. There is a tendency to look at the framework of institutions as a whole and say it's pretty good. If a student asks, can I pass the course with a C minus? The answer is yes. The US framework can pass the course. But that's not a great grade. And to equate the mere success in transiting the program with superior performance is not to focus on the critical need to do better. The US system today passes. It doesn't get an A plus. What are the enhancements? I'm going to talk a bit about the federal joint venture. I'm going to simplify this program. I'm not talking about private rights. I'm not talking about the state attorneys general and their role in this process. And I'm not, until the very end, going to talk about the link to international institutions. I am just talking about what the two federal institutions do. I'm going to talk a bit about the joint venture through which the US delivers federal policy. And I'm going to touch on six areas where the US system could do better and improve its capacity to deliver good policy results at the IP high-tech antitrust intersection. Clearance, the pooling of experience across the two agencies, the FTC Act and its place in the constellation of enforcement tools, litigation, remedies, and research. What about the joint venture? DOJ and the FTC are both substitutes and complements. The substitution is unique in the US system of economic regulation in that it is a deliberate conscious policy choice. We have a number of areas in the scope of economic regulation where firms find that they are subject to oversight by more than one public institution, but it's rare that that's the consequence of so deliberate a policy choice. The Clayton Act Section 7 does precisely that. And it identifies no principle that decides who's going to do what. Breathtaking. You both get to operate in the same policy domain. They're substitute institutions. But they're also complements. This was a specific aim of the FTC design, Section 6 and 9, big information gathering and reporting powers that the Department of Justice lacked. And Section 7, which I'll come back to a bit more in the FTC Act, 
That's the mechanism that allows the FTC to serve as a master in chancery, advising on remedies and competition cases in the federal courts, used once in nearly a century, not since the teens at the beginning of the 20th century, more in a bit about how a dormant capacity might provide the agency a better basis for being the remedy agency in competition law. Uh, and last, with these substitute and complementary features, the quality of the US system as a whole depends on team production here and integration. How well does the joint venture function? It's not enough to say one part of the venture is doing well, the other's not doing so well, that there's acrimony, but they tend to muddle through. The quality of the US system depends on the quality of collaboration between these institutions. It's joint production with all of the problems that arise when you take two rival enterprises and put them into a common cause, and the quality of production depends upon their willingness to work well together. I have never seen a commercial context in which that joining up of rivals works smoothly. That is a built-in source of acrimony, and overcoming it is the key to whether or not the venture is effective over time. How's the integration going today? How do we fill out the report card? Well, there have been some successes. The 2010 horizontal merger guidelines count as a success. And before the happy glow of appreciation wears off, it's probably good to take into account how that happened. Is this a one-off? Because you had two co-authors at Berkeley, both come to Washington with this as the principal aim for what they were going to do, each at a different agency with a personal commitment and commitment from their agencies to make this work, how often are you going to put that together over time? But it did work. And however you can get it, I suppose you should accept it gratefully. But the nature of cooperation is what I would call generally reluctant. It happens as needed. If you add merger guidelines that were put out in 1992, and you go through the store of competition policy pro products, and you notice that that 1992 sale date looks a little bit stale compared with others, and you finally realize that you desperately need an upgrade, or your product's simply going to be swept off the shelves and no one will touch it, you'll lose influence, yes, that's an imperative to get something done. And the agencies did rally to come about and make that happen. It's a genuine, significant accomplishment. But it's only done as needed. It is not a willing, wholehearted recognition of complementarities and capabilities. And there is often in our field taken that the absence of visible conflict, that is, if they're not fighting in the no man's land between 9th Street and 7th Street, they're working pretty well. And they take the general assurance of the chairman of the FTC and the head of the antitrust division appearing together before a congressional committee, a smile, a handshake, how are you doing? We're just doing really well as being a sign that things work very effectively between them. My suggestion is that the US system and the joint venture operates well inside the production possibilities frontier. Not at the level of F, C plus, C, C minus, but it's not an A or A plus. And if you're gonna do really good work in this area, you've gotta work a lot harder to get a good grade for the course. And only a fool would stand back and say, I'm delighted with a C plus. That's good enough. There are two ways to get deeper integration. One I'm going to identify and then skip past. And the other I'm going to talk about more. Two ways. Williamson, Coase, and others said you can achieve deeper integration. You can do it by ownership or you can do it by contract. Three paths to ownership. You could fold the FTC directly into DOJ with respect to competition functions, make the FTC the super consumer protection agency, maybe pull some functions from other places back into the FTC, and that's how you rationalize the system. The other is you give all the civil portfolio to the FTC, and DOJ puts the criminal division uh, uh, in, in charge of doing the criminal matters that DOJ handles now, or you come up with a hybrid plays with this allocation in different ways. 
I'm going to duck for two reasons. Um, in the late 90s, I wrote a paper that said, if you're going to have one, give it all the DOJ. Changed my mind a bit. <laughs> the FTC improved just a little over that time. Did a number of things much differently, better, greater realization of possibilities. I'm not so sure that was the right call. I also, in seeing DOJ face to face, became less enamored with their performance. My sense of how well they were doing diminished uh, somewhat. But the other reason is I just don't know what the right hybrid is. I don't know off of this menu what the right choice is. And final basis for ducking on this one, I don't immediately see the kind of exogenous shock that would cause the national legislature to overcome the hardwired features of the legislative process through which legislators derive income streams from their oversight of agencies that oversight individual firms, I don't know what kind of earthquake it would take to shake loose this process. Although it is interesting, isn't it, to see how often the President of the United States in his State of the Union address or in other areas says, I'm really interested in the org chart of government. I notice a lot of areas of overlapping responsibility. Maybe he'll never get around to it, but maybe he will. And if you observe this field, do you want to bet that it could never happen? I don't see immediately the event that would shake this process dramatically to cause the top line to be adjusted, but I wouldn't want to put it out of mind. And when you look at the FTC and you see how often in its history it's been an incubator for other institutions, the SEC, the CPSC, you become very nervous that people could look at the seams of your agency and simply unzip them, take pieces apart, and reallocate. There's no inevitable determinism to the existing configuration of power. The other way to integrate is by contract. That's the method that has been chosen to date, and I'm going to talk about deeper integration. A less superficial integration, a deeper combination of effort. Let's start with clearance. This is the manner, this is the mechanism by which the two agencies, done by formal agreement since the late 1940s, decide who does what in this system. There are lots of costs in the status quo. I'll simply identify a few. One is that in key areas of activity, there is a mindless subdivision of activity that ought to be consolidated in one industry. I'm deeply influenced by my experience in watching the aerospace sector and talking to companies that have had successful aircraft programs over time. Having had the benefit of uh, being able to speak at length with people like Ben Rich, Kelly Johnson, Ben Heineman, all responsible in their companies for iconic aircraft programs over time. A key message that came out of their discussions was the importance of learning curves within programs and across programs. That by the time they had gone through their careers, they had worked on dozens of different projects. And the good company built into the next program what it had learned from the previous one. And the great aircrafts in the military and commercial domains often are the product of cumulative learning. To put it in terms of sport, the more at-bats you get, the more times you touch the ball, the more shots, the more proficient you come at that specific task. What has happened in the clearance area? Here's an example. Who gets custody of Google? Google's a really cool prize in this business. Hugely visible. This is how you make a reputation. If you stop the merger in the dog food industry, well, good for you. If you prevent exclusive dealing in the, in the fur line bathtub sector, that's quite an accomplishment as well. But the Wall Street Journal isn't going to put you on B1, much less A1. And the New York Times, which tells people how to think in this city, is not going to put you at the front of the business section either. Google is much more interesting. What have the agencies done? They both want it. They both have claims for expertise. They've subdivided the experience. The FTC gets the non-merger stuff, and the Department of Justice gets the mergers. How completely idiotic. And why is it idiotic? These are extraordinarily complex commercial developments. They're not just two-sided industries. They are multi-terrorist industries, depending on how you call it, four, five, six sides. Interdependent features running through them. 
and to for any one institution to get its arms around what's going on is extraordinarily difficult. You want the same team to be looking at all the Google stuff because they go down the learning curve faster. And only a country that was committed to inferior analysis would subdivide activity this way. And it hasn't just been for Google, it has been for other sectors. Defense was split in weird ways in the 1990s and early part of the previous decade. Second, there are temptations for manipulation. How do you build an experience base? It's related in part to the last inquiry you did. How do you build the base of the last inquiry? You might be tempted to do a broader investigation. Look at more product lines. Ask for more information because that helps extend the footprint that becomes the basis for the next fight. And it's a continuing source of institutional friction. Is there hand-to-hand -hand combat in every clearance matter? No. But the one time it happens, maybe once a month, maybe once every two months, it drains the goodwill account down to zero. And the good feeling that has been built up before is instead converted into, they seem to be nice, but I know it. Now they have put the Jolly Roger up on the mast. I knew there were pirates before, and they are once more. And I really don't trust them. And because these fights often migrate their way right up to the top of the agencies, the heads of the two agencies get a chance to see how much fun this is and have pleasant chats about who will do what. And often resolve through bizarre trades that would make free agency exchanges and professional sports seem to be simple transactions. With draft choices, cash, players to be named later, conditional draft choices depending on status over time, this is the way that these matters get resolved. And oh yeah, the squabbling takes time. Not only can you eliminate the first 30-day waiting period, but the real pleasure of private practice is getting to make the phone call to the client and say, we're going to have to pull our filing and refile because I just got a call from this agency that said they got it. It's day 29 and they said I have the following choice. I can pull and refile or I'm going to get a boilerplate second request tomorrow. What will it be? And the client says, say what? How can that possibly be? This is the United States we're talking about, isn't it? It's not some completely irretrievable banana republic, and it's not fair to the banana republics. Because many of them work much better than this with the merger review process. We're going to have to pull and refile in order for the agencies to do what they should. The agencies tried to solve this in 2002. Came up with a much more rational formula. Why did it fall apart? And I blame this self that myself for this. This is an insight that should have come from my academic career that I didn't apply. I got to visit the Senate Commerce Committee on the morning that the deal was announced. And by the end of the day, it had cratered. The Senate Commerce Committee was furious because the FTC was giving almost all of the media and entertainment matters to the Department of Justice. You get to do them. I got to see that unfiltered, hot blowtorch of disapproval to which a person reveals the depths of emotion without the polite filtering that takes place over time for purposes of a happy and harmonious civilization. In other words, they didn't pull any punches in telling me what they thought. But the main punch was this one. We get money for our members based upon the industries you oversee. You don't have to look at all of the deals. It just has to seem that you are a player. Because they have to give us respect in the form of contributions. And oh yes, in media, we don't mind it when the talent comes to visit us. When you get to see Brad and Angelina, when you get to the, go to the Time Warner blowout party in December before Christmas, we like that too. It's more or less like being on the Silk Road. And as each merchant made their way through the little city states, you had to stop and see the head of state and provide a little gift. Now, the head of state sometimes took the little gift and put it in the giant room with all the other little gifts. But they were glad when you came by and very disappointed if you didn't visit. We like all of those things. As one member of the staff pointed out to me, what you did by moving those sectors over to the Department of Justice 
is the equivalent of a company writing to a shareholder and saying, we've just extinguished your stock. We have eliminated an income stream. Thank you for your interest in our company. Those aren't your industries, they are our industries. It's a community property arrangement, and if you want to alienate them, you need our signature on the deed too. To fix this in the future will require a three-way negotiation between the agencies, between themselves, and with the Congress to do this. And I know that in the process of making decisions, it's hard to take something away from a committee without giving them something back. I don't know what series of trades will make that happen. But if this mechanism stays in place, that's a built-in way to diminish experience and knowledge with respect to some of the industries that we've been talking about today. Pooling experience. In the merger area in particular, with the application of the 2010 guidelines standing out, what you have are separate teams in the two agencies, capable teams, groups of them. What you'd really like is that those teams pool their experience. How's it going in the application of the guidelines? What wrinkles are you seeing? Look at all the innovation related provisions. How are you applying them case by case? What are you learning in this process? Not a one year consultation with a casual discussion between friends, but a working group that joins up the individual merger groups over time so that they talk about this and what they're learning. Again, down the learning curve. That doesn't happen today. There's sporadic contacts, but the systematic exchange of know-how does not take place. What would it do? Would it increase the knowledge base in each industry? Each agency's knowledge of specific sectors would improve, and for tricky questions that come up all the time in IP licensing associated with merger review as remedies, a much better discussion about how to write those agreements in ways that provide good results instead of messes involving interpretation of what has to be turned over and who's going to do something about it. And particularly when you adopt new guidelines and you have two ships, you want those ships to turn in precisely the same way so that the outside world gets a sense that you have a coherent system. So you want the case handlers to be talking about what they're doing all the time in a formal routine process of pooling information. What about the FTC Act? Interest at the commission in developing a policy statement. That's great. Agency hasn't had one in its history. Now coming up on its centennial, that's not a bad place to start. But to really solve the role of Section 5 and the rest of the universe will require a conversation with the department. Because for purposes of public policy making in the joint venture, making decisions about what's a good Section 2 case, what's better suited for the specific characteristics of the Federal Trade Commission process, as a matter of doctrine, where would we like policy to be five years from now, 10 years from now? And what selection of cases, what application of doctrine will get it there? Instead of the Justice Department seeing Section 5 as an irritant, or worse, a threat, where the FTC is going to engage in an enveloping process to sweep around it, encircle it with another band of enforcement possibilities for the department to see it, this is an integral part of the conversation about, for example, how dominant firms ought to be treated. I assure you that conversation hasn't happened yet. That would require a degree of will, a fundamental reassessment of what the joint venture is supposed to do. Litigation, similar point and related. The question is posed from time to time outside the United States, should the United States have a specialized competition court? Answer, it does already. And again, as part of a fuller discussion between the two agencies, what should go through that court? What matters are best suited for administrative elaboration? Are there matters where the department might sit back and say, we're better off if that case, CEG American Airlines, predatory pricing, if that case makes its way through the administrative process? We have confidence in that mechanism. It's better that you do it, although American Airlines, common carrier, couldn't have done it. Separate question for reform on another day is cleaning up the anachronism of specific exemptions. But are there matters where the department might say, is that one of our sectors? It is. Is it, though, something that's better suited for resolution by the FTC? And might we form, God forbid, a common working group 
where the case handlers at the department and the case handlers at the FTC work together on the matter, and the FTC brings it through its own system. And see again, this is part of a collaborative joint venture rather than largely watertight compartments that cooperate as needed. Can the FTC be the Federal Remedies Agency? In many ways, I think Congress had that in mind with Section 7, the master and chancery point, combined with Section 6 and 9, information gathering. What could come out of this? Uh, a rethink of the formulation of remedies, deeper cooperation between the agencies, the FTC's compliance unit, the new vesting of authority in Bob Kramer as general counsel at DOJ, but again, a routine process of working in collaboration where the agencies talk about what they're learning in the course of implementing individual remedies. Not sporadic contacts over time, those occur. But a sustained common working group that focuses on this is a key element of policymaking. What did you learn in the last licensing agreement? What did you do here when you mandated access? What did you do over there when you established a behavioral control and as the interest in behavioral controls increases, wanes, increases over time, the value, again, of pooling this experience so that designers touch more individual products or are more aware of them in deciding how to do the next one is very valuable. Last, the research agenda, the common program. Well, one element of evaluation. The first project I worked on at the FTC when I was young in 1979 was a project that Mike Perchuk had put in motion to assess the effects of past commission cases. And I fully take on board Dennis Carlton's observation that you can't just look at individual events as the basis for formulating large views about what the agency does. You need a broader perspective, but the individual examinations can be quite informative nonetheless. We had the lavish amount of $10,000 to spend on an academic to go and look at this. And we got a young, bright guy named Tim Bresnahan, assistant professor at Stanford, who with the encouragement of Richard Cave said, I'll do it. And Bresnahan took a look based on the commission's internal records, publicly available data that he could see at Xerox, and came up with a paper that you know of quite well in the American Economic Review published in 1986. This kind of research shed very useful light on the Commission's theory of the case, its use of the mandatory licensing requirement, and what took place. You'd like to do these little episodic examinations of a number of instances in which you rely, for example, on compulsory licensing as a pro-entry facilitating device, and to have a common program where the two agencies sit down at the beginning of the year and say, what's the research agenda going ahead between us? How does it help us build sectoral expertise so that we develop and apply the institutional memory we have? How can we build partnerships with external bodies, other researchers that do work? Can we put better data into the public domain to stimulate debate on matters such as patent policy? Can we engage in a better advocacy pro program to target problems we have identified in the course of investigations and litigation? And most important, every year, every budget cycle, where is the well-identified increment for R&D? If you want to do work in R&D intensive sectors, you better have your own R&D program that builds knowledge because that's basically all you have in addition to the human beings who work for you. Focal points of the program, better understanding of how specific firms that are technologically dynamic are organized as well as a better ability to learn what you did in the last cases, the last investigations, and looking forward. An example of how this could have been enormously useful. It's not a high-tech example as such. It involves baby food. And I did a bit of work for the merging parties in the unsuccessful baby food case just before going to the FTC, where I emphasized to my colleagues how wrong I had been. Um, in this instance, uh, in baby food, uh, Merger of two lesser players, Beechnutten and, uh, and, and, and Heinz, the leading firm was Gerber. The FTC in the late 1970s was thinking of bringing an abusive dominance case that didn't involve abuse. It was going to be monopolization without conduct. And again, the office I worked in was looking at candidates to be the no-conduct monopolization defendants in a Section 5 case. 
Three firms were identified as being very attractive candidates. Number one, Campbell Soup. Number two, Eastman Kodak, with its perpetual unending domination of the photographic film market, a condition that could never be changed and would always be significant. Three, Gerber. The memo goes on to talk about how Gerber, going back to the 40s, well back into the 40s, with that smiling little kid on the bottle, had always been in the neighborhood of 60 to 70, 60 to 70, and it stuck at 70. And who were the also rands in 78? Beechnut and Heinz. And they seemed trapped there. It wasn't going to change. If you had brought that detailed analysis forward into the merger case, and you were wondering, should we let Heinz buy Beechnut? That could have been a factor at the margin that led you to think, based on your current investigation. It's been stuck at 70 for a long time. That's where Gerber's been. Are we really taking a big risk by letting Heinz buy Beechnut? And to create what Gerber's own document said would be, uh-oh, a serious rival that we'd have to look at. Maybe the case doesn't come out differently, but this was a failure on the part of the agency to bring forward lots of what it had learned before in deciding at the margin in a close case, whether this was a case really of three to two, or maybe instead two to one. Refining theories of harm, better use of the experience base to anticipate remedial effects, and yes, a better idea by looking at lots of industries over time, at least in a general way, to know what to look for, what might happen. Not to suggest it's going to give you a clear idea in each individual case about what's coming about, but general phenomena that emerge in specific cases about how industries change, what the path of technological adjustment is in specific sectors, as well as a deeper knowledge, to use defense again as an example, to spot the firm that's really going to matter and know why. Final thought about, about the future and the international realm. Uh, why does this matter more and more? Well, the traditional complacency is it's an odd system. Uh, it's fragmented, it's quaint, it's really old, and it's ours. Another approach is nothing can be done. Path dependent can't really change it, but we pass the course, and indeed we pass the course now. But looking ahead, other countries are trying to get this right. They're working very hard on getting an institutional framework that is that is more attuned to producing good results. And our approach really is captured in the any monopolization, any antitrust monopoli modernization commission report saying, ah, oh, there's some costs, but they're not, there aren't such demonstrable harms that we really have to worry about this very much. That's the student saying, I'm really happy to pass the course with a C plus. It's okay. That was fine when you're the only one taking the course. And on a curve, maybe the world gives you an A. We have lots of other students in the room, smart ones, working hard to do a better job. And if you want influence in an environment of multiplicity, you only get it by intellectual vision, coherence in policy making. It makes you much more effective in the future. So the costs of complacency, can't change it, going to put up with it, they grow over time, quietly and in subtle ways. New leadership coming to the Department of Justice. Don't know who that will be. If it's Bill Baer, if it is Rich Parker, and maybe it's not, maybe it's no one any of us have heard of, but if it happened to be, and of course these rumors are so often wrong, I remember before one presidential handover, a person being named in the paper, and as I visited this person in the hospital in the last stages of, of cancer, he said, that's an interesting story. I hope they get along with it damn quickly or it's not going to do me any good. Who knows if the stories count for anything, but this is a chance to re-examine this because all of these people, I think, in their souls know this is a problem. And it can be kicked down to other generations, but it could be an occasion to reset and rethink at least some things on the list. And again, I come back to the President of the United States who has looked at the organization chart of government for trade and a number of other areas, and he mentions it, spends the precious time in the State of the Union address to say, I'm on it. Good time 
to take that as an occasion to rethink specific items on this list. Thanks. Thank you very much, Bill. We have, uh, we have some time for uh, some questions, I think. We've got a few minutes here, so any questions? By the way, right, right here. Do we need the microphone for this, or we're just going to speak up? Do you need the mic? Uh, Darren Soka, Tech Freedom. Uh, great presentation. I uh, just want to hear you expand on your comments about the uh, banana republic analogy and ask you what your institutional analysis tells you about the extent to which our antitrust law is actually consistent with the rule of law. And I mean that in two ways. Uh, one, you're talking about the way the institutions, uh, both of them, are set up, how they interact with each other, and also with Congress. Um, and then second, uh, in terms of the substance of antitrust law, uh, how as Hayek said it made this morning about uh, what Hayek actually might have thought about all this. Is he here today? Uh, he should have been. No. If he had been, I think he would have had some right. things to say this morning and his name was taken in vain. Uh, because, you know, his conception of the rule of law was that the law should tell us uh, what we are prohibited from doing clearly and cleanly and in a generalizable, non-discriminatory fashion so that we can understand what we can do, in, you know, in a free society. And it just seems to me that the, the institutional uh, uh, landscape you've described here today is pretty troubling in that regard and could become even more so when, for example, uh, antitrust is asked to do things like, for example, uh, look at privacy that are not uh, capable of being assessed in a rigorous way that would allow us to understand as firms or individuals, again, what we are prohibited from doing. I think uh, what, I, what I've been describing is, uh, again, what I think is a, is a tax on performance. Uh, I, think, I think that it is a, a surcharge that is applied to the routine operation of, uh, of competition law. I think that once the elaborations are, are, are addressed, once the institutional gauntlet is transited, um, my view of the system, though I'm someone who've been, who's been in it for a long time uh, and am subject to even unconscious intellectual capture on that point, uh, I think that the system ultimately does a pretty good job of providing guidance about what you can do and what you can't do. And indeed, one of its strengths over time, if we ask about the quality of transparency today and guides today versus, say, 40 years ago, uh, vastly improved. Much more interaction with affected parties, much more publication of in intentions, much, much more revelation of data sets about what the agencies do, so that all of the Kremlinologists outside of the building can stand and draw, I think, pretty reliable judgments about what I can do and can't do. Question, what do you mean to do? If not in this case, in the next case. Uh, the last time the FTC prevailed in a litigated challenge under Section 5 of the FTC Act was in the late 1960s. Not for want of trying since, either. Uh, and I think a, you know, if, you, if you look at the paradox that we observe in areas such as merger guidelines, what Don Turner did starting in 1968, what the agencies have done since, the, the paradox is that by focusing attention, by specifying criteria more carefully, the mechanism becomes more effective in addressing the items within, within its uh, domain. The Department of Justice criminal program would never have been successful if it had not at some point said, it's price fixing, it's cartels. As late as the 1960s, the Department of Justice prosecuted firms for monopolization. And a number of you know my favorite story involving United Brands. In California in the 1960s, the Department of Justice brought criminal indictments against United Brands, United Fruit, and individuals in the company for the operative offense was oversupplying the market in Los Angeles with bananas. <laughs> and you can imagine what the scene was in the holding cell, the detention center there, as you bring the people in. What are you in for? Murder. What about you? I robbed a bank, a big bank. What about you? I oversupplied the market with bananas. Uh, the department realized, as time went on, that that system would, would lack legitimacy if there was the threat that it would use criminal process to attack what might be referred to as more ambiguous, competitively ambiguous behavior, and it did that. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think for Section 5, the, the effectiveness 
legitimacy, persuasiveness of what it does would be enhanced greatly by turning in guidelines, policy statement that says this is what we mean to do in this area. Uh, because without it, I think the string of rebukes in the courts when things get to court will continue unabated. And it's a question of how many beatings you want to take before you rethink. All right, Bill, I, we're uh, out of time. So please join me in thanking Bill for his Thank you. Thanks, Henry.